Namji Rula Pinji Sanji Rumba Shu Sanji Chutan Suji Chulam Chandu Bhadu Dhani Chab Suji Taki Shin Suji Pesu Rula Pinji Sanji Rumba Shu Sanji Chutan Suji Chulam Chandu Bhadu Dhani Chab Suji Taki Shin Suji Pesu Rula binji sanji drupa shu sanji musa sushi metata rira blinshi niti jim sanji jindu mitu puwe yin ruka nanda shindu jupa shu sanji namji sambata ala yi jita jita wa chi jindu mati ba yi chi chi kolo kordo so So first we began with the course refuge taking refuge in the three jewels and generating the enlightened intention and then we offered the mandala representing our body and uh, possessions and virtues of the three times uh, in order to receive the teachings and then finally we made a short verse requesting uh, the Buddhas to turn the wheel of the Dharma so in this way we've done a brief, very brief preliminary prayers to be recited when teachings are given. Uh, so concerning that, uh, it said that at the time of receiving teachings is very important for us to have kind of a right attitude and uh, usually therefore it's explained that we can define the wrong attitude for receiving the teachings or the wrong kind of approach to receiving the teachings by the analogy of a, of a pot. So if we have a pot and we wish to fill it with water if the pot is turned upside down obviously no water can go into the pot. And so similarly if we are physically present at the teachings but our attention is elsewhere then we cannot even hear the instructions at all we don't, don't receive them in the first place but if we receive the teachings but then don't retain them in our mind how can we study and practice them subsequently so this is comparable to the second type of pot which is turned the right way up so the water can go in it when it's poured but it has a hole in the bottom so the water goes in but immediately drains out so therefore we cannot drink that water because it's gone similarly if we hear the teachings but don't keep them in our memory then we cannot practice them later so we must retain the teachings that we hear because they're for us to use and then thirdly when we listen to teachings is not enough just to hear them and retain them we must have kind of correct motivation a mind that's not mixed with any impure motivations because otherwise it's like a pot our mind is like a pot that is turned the right way up that has no holes in it but has poison in the bottom if we pour water into that pot and then drink it we'll poison ourselves so similarly if when we are receiving the teachings we have motivations like oh I'm so great or this will make me so great or I become so powerful or I'll be able to impress people these are kind of examples of impure motivation so we, we must replace them with pure motivation for receiving the teachings which is, of course, as His Holiness and uh, Shaman Rinpoche told us so many times, the bodhicitta, the resolve to become a Buddha for the sake of others. Without this motivation for receiving Mahayana teachings, then it's just like a waste. So we need to check our mind when we go to receive teachings. So now we're 
uh, it's the third evening for studying Geshe Chekawa's Seven Points of Mind Training through the commentary composed by the fifth Shama Rinpoche, Kinchu Yenlak. And uh, so, of the seven points, we've reached the third point, which is how to transform negative conditions that arise when we're trying to practice the path, how to transform them into the path itself. So, as you remember, this point is divided, firstly into instructions on how we can use the perspective of conventional bodhicitta. We meditated conventional bodhicitta in point number two. Now how to use that kind of understanding that we got through that in turning negative situations into the path. And that we completed last night. So now the second for changing our attitude when we encounter negative situations is to rely on the perspective of ultimate bodhicitta. So this may be in a way is, is a little more difficult uh, to, to apply initially. But anyway, this is how it's taught. To transform adverse circumstances into the path through ultimate bodhicitta as is taught. So Geshe Chekhova's root text says, Meditate on appearances arising from confusion as being the four kayas. Emptiness is the supreme protection. So, actually to really understand this verse properly, we need of course to understand uh, exactly what is specified by the four kayas. Kaya of course is a Sanskrit word and it refers to the, the bodies of an enlightened, of a Buddha, of a fully enlightened Buddha. That is to say that a Buddha's reality compro comprises four different modes, four different modes of being. And so, here the teaching is telling us that we can train, we can come to see how whatever arises for us, whatever appearances arise for us in this world, how, although they are the projection of our own mind, they are empty, precisely because they are just the projections of our mind. Like the mind itself, the appearances, whether good or bad, positive or negative, beautiful or ugly, they are all just emptiness, like the mind itself. So, this is how Shama Kyunche Yenlaki explains this. All forms of suffering and undesirable circumstances emerge from the mind's confused projections. That is a If um, the ignorance that is arising in every moment for us was replaced by transcendental wisdom, if we had conquered ignorance, then all appearances would be totally pure for us. But because of this ignorance that is arising every moment, which co we do not recognize First, let all appearances are our mind, and we do not recognize that, like the mind, they are empty. So they are confused appearances or confused projections. We think of them as external to the mind, and as we saw in the evenings, first evening's teachings, we label them good and bad, and we react to them with desire and hatred and so on. But despite that, they're never anything but the projections of mind, just like the appearances we see in a dream. And the mind itself that projects them, we cannot find. It has no intrinsic nature, it's empty. So the very nature of confusion is wisdom. 
they say that mind's fundamental nature is absolutely pure and it has been from beginningless time as his holiness was explaining today mind's real nature has never been mixed with ignorance and with the disturbing emotions they're like clouds that cover it but have never become part of it so whatever arises from the mind is just wisdom if we could recognize the mind as it really is so Shama continue, continues observe the essence of suffering or look at suffering when suffering arises for you or other negative experiences look right into them since this suffering does not arise from anywhere at all it is Dhammakaya the dimension of absolute reality the Dhammakaya the truth body of the Buddhas and the truth body of the Buddhas the Dhammakaya is un arising and unceasing it is beyond every dualistic label including existence and non-existence so this suffering although it appears vividly as suffering it has no real nature just like images seen in a dream it doesn't therefore come from anywhere it has no real place of origination and so even in its arising that suffering is empty and has never changed into anything else it cannot change into anything else it's empty from the very beginning and that emptiness is the true nature of reality which we call the Dhammakaya the truth body at the same time since there is nothing to that suffering that will cease it is Sambhogakaya the dimension of perfect enjoyment means only something that has a beginning in time can end but as this vivid appearance of suffering or whatever it has has no real beginning because it's always empty we cannot talk about it ceasing as it would if it had a true beginning so it's unceasing nature in the sense that it is always just emptiness and never changes from that is we call Sambhogakaya just as although the Buddha's reality is the Dharmakaya beyond all labels and concepts yet the Buddha appears in the Sambhogakaya to high bodhisattvas so there is to that suffering emptiness and at the same time clear unceasing appearance so that we call Sambhogakaya since in between in between no beginning and no end there is nothing that abides it is Nirmanakaya meaning because we don't find any place where that vivid appearance of suffering arose and we don't find any place where it stops to say oh here it is now in this present moment I can grasp it it's like this is impossible there's no way we can take hold of that suffering as if as we could if it was something real and solid and that we call therefore the Nirmanakaya because the Nirmanakaya is the magical emanation body of the Buddha the way that although the Buddha had achieved enlightenment eons ago he appeared in this world two and a half thousand years ago in India to perform the 12 deeds of a Buddha all this was a magical display to train sentient beings in the way to enlightenment the Buddha really his real nature never changed from the Dhammakaya but magically there arose to the vision of human beings this emanation form so similarly this suffering is vivid and distinct but when we 
is it where we could pop it it has no solidity this is its no manakaya nature and finally Shamakun Shiyangla says since these kayas are indivisible the Dhammakaya, the Sambhogakaya, the Namanakaya are not three different things just side by side they are one reality seen in three different ways we call this fact that the vivid appearance of suffering is empty from the beginning but unceasing and doesn't abide we call the fact that that's all one reality just emptiness we call that the integral body or the swabhavakakaya the dimension of the essential nature so that is Kunji Enlek's brief explanation of this point but it is very subtle because actually it is a kind of what we call a neutral an introduction to the true nature and so we need therefore uh, to have real certainty about what the four kayas means and then we need to have some experience of the ultimate bodhicitta meditation so that we have really got some experience of emptiness then we can apply this we can look into appearances as they arise in everyday life even very negative ones and see their emptiness and that is why it says emptiness is the supreme protection meaning if we can see the emptiness not just in not intellectually but in a way in a feeling way if we can feel the emptiness experience the emptiness of whatever arises we're protected from all confusion and negative circumstances become part of the path it's like they feed our realization because when we can encounter strong appearances even negative ones and at the same time as they arise experience their emptiness they strengthen our experience of emptiness that is why it's said in the Zogpa Chempo teachings the arising of the concepts and disturbing emotions feeds the Rigpa meaning the, the primordial awareness but this is a very kind of as I say very subtle and, and important teachings perhaps one way to to kind of begin it uh, begin to to relate to this is when strong experiences strong appearances arise including like suffering physical or mental to look into them with a very kind of calm mind very stable mind and ask well what is the color of that so if it's as if there's sadness in the mind to look into and say what is the color of this or where is this right now where is this or what shape does it have and in that way it kind of uh, lessens our grasping at this appearance or this experience as something as something solid and that is a kind of approach to this uh, teaching to see everything as the four kayas because you see the way it's expressed we could think that what is meant here is when negative appearances arise we have to do an intellectual kind of reminding ourselves oh it's the four kayas because Dhammakaya means this, Sambhogakaya means that, and Nirmanakaya means this and it's all the Svabhavakakaya well that's in a way doing it like that is too intellectual it is not what this teaching is is about it's as I say approaching it to try to look into the emptiness of everything that appears while it appears so and that's the way to begin to relate to it so that's the advice on relying on the perspective of ultimate bodhicitta so that's how to deal with attitudes how to use changing attitudes to take negative situations onto the path but there's a second part to this point which is 
using activities, special activities, that will also help us with the task of making adverse circumstances or negative circumstances into the path. So, the commentary says, second, transforming adverse circumstances into the path through accumulation and purification practices. So, in Geshe Chakawa's root text, this is what he says. The supreme method is comprised of the four activities. Four activities. So there's a, there are four kind of collections of techniques we're going to hear about now, which will be very helpful in giving us the, the power to deal with negative situations that, as we mentioned last night, will definitely arise for us if we practice the Dharma strongly. So the first of these activities, or forces, or powers, if you like, the first of these, Kunchi Yenla says, is the activity of accumulating merit, which, of course, happily enough, uh, we've been discussing with it, listening to His Holiness explain to us. So, Kunchi Yenla says, Whenever that you, you feel that you would like to be happy, I suppose that's right, most of the time. <laughs> oh no, I think I'd rather be sad today. No, it's, it's a, funny how we don't say that very often. <laughs> Whenever you feel that you would like to be happy, consider, he says, consider that this wish for happiness is a sign that you should accumulate merit. Why? Because merit is the cause of happiness. Of, uh, that means, of course, a happiness that is not originating with something non-virtuous. If you think happiness comes from beating your friends and stealing their food and so on and so forth, then that's another thing. But for authentic happiness, then it comes only from virtuous actions. That is, as we mentioned before the kind of fundamental equation because there's a relationship of connection or dependence between virtue and happiness. So if I think to myself, what must I do to be happy? Well, apart from going to the nearest excellent new Indian shopping mall, the real more profound answer is I need merit. I need to, to accumulate merit. How? Kunji Yenla says, accumulate merit through body, speech, and mind. It says, well, you've got the equipment for making merit. You've got body, you've got speech, and you've got mind. So use these to do merit, very powerful virtuous actions that produce the merit that ripens as happiness. So he mentions some activities we can use making offerings to the Lama and the three jewels making offerings is so good because it's of course a great form of giving and as Nagarjuna says there is no better friend for the next life than giving so even if we're just concerned with with kind of uh, worldly happiness in this life and the future practice practice giving there is no there is no better friend and if the giving is to really superior objects like our lamas and the three jewels so much stronger the merit will will be so make offerings to the lama and the and the three jewels serving the sangha again here the the recipients of our service, our help, our noble uh, field. It's said in the Sutra of the Three Jewels, the Sangha are an excellent, it means the ordained Sangha by the way, the, the, the renunciate Sangha is an excellent field of merit. So therefore to serve uh, our monks and nuns is a wonderful way to make merit because they are the pure sign, the pure embodiment 
of the training in moral discipline. So their moral discipline, the purity of their moral discipline kind of rubs off on us if we serve them with respect. So serve the ordained Sangha. And then he says, offering traumas to elemental spirits and so on. You know, there's another way to make merit. But that will also be dealt with under another heading. So we'll, we'll come back to that. And one could also add to this things like making prostrations. There's a wonderful way to make merit. Reciting the, the, the Buddha words, the sutras, like reciting Heart Sutra and uh, reciting the aspiration prayers, like King of Aspiration Prayers, Samantha Bhadra's prayer, 10th chapter of the Bodhicharya, which is Holiness taught in Karma Gun many years ago. And uh, the um, uh, prayer from the uh, Galongma Palmo, the great nun Galongma Palmo. So these kind of prayers would be very good. And especially a way of making merit that is kind of connected with Lojong, he says is this. Having fervently prayed to the Lama and the Three Jewels, you can say, as part of your prayer, if it is preferable that I be sick, pray grant the blessing of illness. If it is preferable that I recover, pray grant the blessing of healing. If it is preferable that I die, pray grant the blessing of death. Why is this? Because this, if we have the courage to do this prayer, it will cut right through all hope and fear. Right now, we have a kind of small and shrunken mind. We hope for certain outcomes and fear others. But Lojong generates in us an enormous openness and courage because we learn to see the emptiness of all phenomena, whether positive or negative. And at the same time, we open ourselves to others completely from the heart. So to strengthen that courage and openness of Lojong, we can try to pray like this. In other words, whatever is to happen is okay. Whatever is to happen, I accept. Whatever will be better for my Dharma progress, I will accept. I will not try to control and manipulate things to protect my ego. I will be completely uh, accepting of whatever arises. It's said in the histories that the, the early Kadampa practitioners really practiced like this. Many just sought out very lonely places and made this kind of prayer, uh, like mm, uh, suffering happiness, death bliss. This was the, the, the kind of slogans that they made into their prayers. In other words, this total fearlessness and acceptance of, of whatever happened as just the path. So the second, that's the first uh, activity, making merit. The second, uh, says, the second is the activity of purifying negativities. So the negative is God's means like digpa, sins, non-virtuous or negative actions. The second is the activity of purifying negativities. Whenever you feel that you would like to be free from suffering, consider that this is a sign that you should abandon the cause of sufferings, which are misdeeds or non-virtuous actions. So firstly, we, we heard that if you want to be happy, make merit. Now we're hearing if you don't want to suffer, then abandon the causes of suffering, which are non-virtue. Because again, there's a relationship of dependency between non-virtue and suffering. So we need to do a lot of purification, as Holiness has been explaining to us. Confess, so we, how do we make, how do we purify? Well, 
Lord Buddha himself said that the best means of purifying negative actions is, is confession. Confession. Shakpa in uh, Tibetan. Confession. Uh, we can say if, we, if we're a little shy about using the word confession, maybe acknowledgement of misdeeds. If it, if it makes you feel more happy to say that, I, I can swing with that. Personally, I'm okay with confession. I'm old enough to know I, I really need it. Um, maybe when you get as old as me, you'll need it. You'll know it too. So, four powers of confession. And Kunji, that kind of mentions it here, but I'll pick them out more specifically. For confession, to really purify negativities that we've done, we must have the power of regret. In as we must sincerely be contrite, sincerely regret having done negativities. Otherwise, how are we letting them, how are we getting rid of their power? If we don't regret having done selfish things, harmed others, abused others, we're not going to purify that stain from our mind stream. So there must be regret. And regret comes, of course, through understanding the consequences, the problems we've caused for ourselves and for others by negative action. So first, regret. As Kunjina says, confess those negative actions of the past with remorse. Not regret, yeah. But regret is not enough because we may regret it but then think, well, I can do it again though whenever I feel like it. So we must have the second power which is the power of resolve. Resolve not to do that again. If it really causes suffering for others and ourselves, we must make that strong commitment that we will not make that mistake again. So he says, resolve not to commit others in the, in the future. Or else, confession is just a means like of clearing our account only so we can go and spend again. <laughs> clearing our debts so we can go and make another debt again. Sounds like the European economies. Uh, but that's not the way. And strive to forsake negative actions through the many available methods. That signifies two further powers. The third power we need for confession to be effective is called the power of reliance. Or, yes, power of reliance. It means this. When we do negative actions, it creates an impression as his home is translated, or bakchak in Tibetan, vasana in Sanskrit, an imprint, a tendency to repeat. One way that karma works is that having done a certain action, there's a greater likelihood of repeating it. It's kind of, that's how, part, how in some ways karma ripens. So we need, because we've weakened ourselves, when we do a selfish action, we, we weaken our strength, we need something strong to rely upon, to kind of raise us up. So we need the power of object. That's why when we make confession prayers, formally in Buddhism, we pray in front of a Buddha, whether it's in the Vajrayana method of meditating on Vajrasattva, or whether it's the, the non-tantric method of confession in front of the 35 Buddhas. These are the power of reliance because they embody all our good aspirations and all of the kind of purity, the primordial natural purity of our mind which we've lost contact with through our negativity. So we, re, we kind of rely on that. So at least pray to the three jewels or to the, as I say, to the Buddhas of confession. Or if you're practicing Vajrayana, Vajrasattva. And then the fourth power, which is this weakness that you've created in yourself through negative actions, you need, so to speak, some kind of spiritual vitamins to make you strong again. What are they? Doing specific virtuous actions that will build up your Dharma muscles, so to speak, or fill you with Dharma vitamins. 
So do good actions, make prostrations, make prayers, and so on and so forth. So those are the four powers that we need for effective confession. Power of regret, power of resolving, power of reliance, and the power of the uh, remedies. So that is the second activity, purifying negativities. The third activity that will help us transform negativities into the path, Shamakunji Allah says, the third is making offerings to malevolent forces. In Tibetan, dun. These are kind of like malevolent spirits. Whenever obstacles arise, due to malevolent and obstructing forces, dun or gek in Tibetan. And remember, as I mentioned, it's often said that when we try to practice Dharma strongly, obstacles arise. Maybe some generated by our own resistance to Dharma, our own bad habits, but also some in a way generated through others and through external forces. So these are the malevolent and obstructing forces. Now, normally one might think, oh, they're an enemy. They are preventing me to do what I want to do. I want to practice the Dharma and then these malevolent forces are obstructing me. So they're my enemy and I must crush them, I must remove them, or I must run away from them. That is not Lojong attitude. Lojong attitude is openness and courage. So he says, Kunya says, whenever obstacles arise due to malevolent and obstructing forces, offer them the tormas with a deeply grateful frame of mind. The tormas are the, essentially they're just food offerings, but of course in Tibet these became elaborated in a kind of very uh, beautiful ways in different shapes according to different traditions and different monastic traditions but essentially they're food offerings and they are like a kind of symbol and a projection of our willingness to give in this case to give to harmful spirits rather than to try to destroy them or run away from them just as Lord Buddha himself told his monastic disciples when they encountered the demoness Harati and her 500 children, uh, 500 de demonic children, that his disciples should always give the tormas, the, the dough balls, to such obstructive spirits, and then they would help the Dharma. So we too, when we meet difficulties caused by malevolent forces, we should give. And if we know how to do the ritual, we can give them tormas. But the most important thing is the mental attitude. So he says, give them tormas with a deeply grateful frame of mind. Why should we be grateful? They're causing obstacles to us. Because, as we heard yesterday, those who cause us harm are giving us a wonderful opportunity to develop strong patience and through that strong compassion and realization of emptiness. So the Lojang attitude to such apparitions, such difficulties arising in life is, as I said, very open because they're training us. They're giving us a further opportunity to train. Look, if there is no difficulties coming into our life, where would patience come from? As we discussed last night. So some problems have arisen from my practice. Okay, no problem. I will give to them, I will open to them. If you, if you, at first you, you, you cannot develop the courage of such an attitude of gratitude to them, Kunjana says at least, if this is impossible, as you offer traumas to them, say, do not create obstacles to my Dharma practice. I will do whatever I can to help you. In other words, when I develop deep Dharma realization, I will directly help you. But right now at least, please don't cause obstacles and I give you this present so you won't, you won't do so. So the Lojong attitude to, to such beings is very interesting. 
because uh, often we, you know, we, we would want to protect ourselves from them uh, and even use rituals uh, to protect ourselves from them. But the Lodong attitude is, is fearless. It's, it's just kind of, in a way, protection by openness and compassion rather than anything else. I see the local malevolent forces and uh, obstacle makers are, are tuning up. <laughs> Last year they played Indian heavy metal. <laughs> so uh, I suppose this is Indian disco. It's, uh, it's, uh, but as Shantideva says, where do the demons and the weapons of the demons in hell come from? From an angry mind. So, this, this is, let's remember, however bad it gets, it's, it's our mind. <laughs> mm. The demons discovered disco. Oh, actually, I, personally, I think they invented it, but that's another thing. <laughs> yeah. So then the fourth activity, a little similar to third, really. The fourth is making offerings to the Dharma protectors. So now we, we're talking about those uh, beings, whether wisdom beings, such as Makala, Makali, or oath-bound protectors, those who were worldly gods, but uh, uh, promised to protect the Buddha, Buddha's teaching, sorry, like the kings of the four directions. We should support our practice by making offerings to the Dharma protectors. And in the early Kadampa tradition, the main Dharma protector was a form of Mahakala called Kumpo Trigu, uh, the, 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 Dhamma, the protector with the, the Trigu, the cutter. Uh, but of course, as you are Kamakaju, then this means relying upon Banagtian and Paudin Lamo and all the other great Dharma protectors, both wisdom protectors and Oupan protectors of Kamapa's teaching. As you offer them, Thomas, pray that all circumstances which hinder Dharma practice are pacified and favorable conditions are established. And of course, even if one only practices a short uh, ritual to Dharma protectors like Madhakma, everything is included in, in that. So that is the fourth practice, uh, fourth activity, making offerings to the Dharma protectors. There's one last line in this uh, third point. One last line from the root text. The root text says, join unexpected events with your practice. If unexpected, so could you like explains, if unexpected tribulations, tribulations, that's a very nice biblical word. If unexpected tribulations, like difficulties and trials, if unexpected tribulations such as illness, negative forces, enemies and so forth before you all of a sudden, you should think with the utmost sincerity. In our universe, there is no end to the different kinds of intense suffering similar to this. May they all gather into myself. You know, Lojong, as I say, is about openness and courage. And one test of whether we have that openness and courage is how we handle things that come to us on, out of the side, so to speak, come to us suddenly. That if we were planning things, we haven't planned for. If we're, you know, they're, they're unexpected. Now, as His Holiness said this afternoon, you know, it's not wrong to make some plans, but of course, that is just our human projection on, on the flow of dependent origination. We don't even know what karma will ripen for us in the future. So unexpected things can always, can always turn up. If our minds are very rigid because we're so tight and so wanting to control things and predict things, we will not be able to incorporate those things into our practice. So a sign that our Lojong practice is strong and we can really apply it in everyday life is that we can respond to such unexpected events with the, the Lojong. And here is, he's, he's specified how we might do that, which is there's no end to all different types of suffering like the one that's just arisen for me now. 
So may all of them that other people are experiencing, like the one that's arisen for me now, surprise suddenly, may come into mind. So once again, we've been able to turn the, the negativity into something uh, positive. Thank you. So that's point three. So uh, we need to press on. Time's winged chariot, as the English poet said, is hurrying behind me. Uh, so we, we need to, to press on now. Which, simple logic, leads us to point four. The fourth point of the seven points. The fourth point shows how to incorporate the practice in one's lifetime. So, Geshe Cheko has a root text. Or uh, maybe I'll explain first. This, there's two parts to this section, the fourth point. One is kind of like instruction for this life, and then the second one is instruction for the time of death. So, first, the instruction for this life. The root text says The epitome of the uh, pith instructions is the application of the five powers. Pith instructions in Sanskrit is Upadesha, in Tibetan is Menak. So the significance of this is like every cycle of Dharma instructions has some kind of really vital points which if you don't know them you will not be able to make that Dharma practice work. So we call these the Upadesha or the the menak, the pith instructions in English. So for the lojong, the pith instructions comprises the application of the five powers. So now Kunji and Light will explain what these five powers are, how they to be practiced, what they do for us. Because uh, Rinpoche said uh, when he taught this um, that if we can master these five powers, we can really make the lojong effective and even achieve the mm, f first noble bodhisattva level, just like Geshe Chekwa himself did, the, the joyful bhumi, which otherwise would take like one eon of practice to, to do. So the five powers. The first is the uh, so-called compelling power. Sometimes I, I prefer the English word like impetus because impetus is something that like hurls you into something that, that starts you off properly with a great force. Um, anyway, the commentary says compel your mind forcefully in this way with the thought from now on this month, this year until I die in fact until I've reached Buddhahood I will never be separated from the two aspects of awakening mind or bodhicitta. I, th I see it like this. You know like uh, in a sprint, in an athletic sprint, like the 100 meters. It's so incredibly important, isn't it, how they come out of the blocks or whatever they call it. Like that they, they hurl themselves forward with incredible strength and, and force. If they don't do that right away out of the blocks, in the 100 meters uh, dash, there's no chance. So it's like the initial impetus is incredibly important in making them successful. Well, so it is with the Lojong. If you're like, oh, maybe I'll generate the Bodhicitta, I'll think about it. <laughs> how, how is this going to work? It's, it's, you're not even going to get out of bed, let alone get to your cushion. <laughs> so. The very first thing is that really extraordinary great resolve. And if you look at the, all the great masters in history, the Kadampa, Kajuba, the Tibetan, Indian, and so on, they all had this incredible resolve. You know, like Jesse Millerepa, when he, when he realized the consequences of his never good action, he had this fantastic resolve to practice, which of course carried him through all the difficulties that he endured. 
and uh, and he arrived at Buddhahood in this very in one very lifetime. So that's kind of like the evidence of the of the need for this compelling power. So as a Lojong practitioner, our thought is. From now till enlightenment, I'll never be separated from conventional ultimate bodhicitta. That will be like the, the main theme in my life. And I'm not going to waste the day. So it begins right now. And then the second power is the part, the second is the power of familiarization. Train again and again in both types of bodhicitta. The word for familiarization in Tibetan is gom. It means like, actually it's the word also used for meditation, but it means make a habit, develop, cultivate. So having the compelling force, getting going with great strength is, as we've seen, really important. But we need to keep returning to that, keep strengthening that initial force, that initial getting going. We need to return to that. So we should, as it were, keep checking in. Like throughout the day, we should return to our motivation, which is the, to be not separated from the bodhicitta. And then the third, the third power that will make the lojong effective is this. The third is the power of sowing white seeds accumulate merit by doing everything you can to generate and s enhance bodhicitta awakening mind so white seeds is a like a a metaphor for good deeds white seeds produce white fruits virtuous actions produce good fruits why do we need good karma if our aim is buddhahood because Good karma ripens as circumstances that help us practice the Dharma, as well as benefiting others. And as a trainee bodhisattva, we should be benefiting others to the extent we can while we're practicing the path with our eyes set on the main goal, which is Buddhahood. So we all need supportive conditions for our Dharma practice. And they can only arise through living a good life through practicing virtue so never neglect the opportunity to to practice virtue even small in seemingly tiny virtues like uh, helping somebody with their shopping or making a cup of tea or something all these never be neglected it said a bodhisattva never wastes any opportunity to make virtue you see, this is very important for us in the West. We've been lucky to meet really great lamas, masters of Mahamudra and Zopa Champo and uh, Anuttara Tantra and so on. And also we, we have a certain degree of intelligence, so we, we kind of understand a little bit intellectually the, the Dharma. But sometimes the conceit can arise. Oh, I don't need these virtuous practices. I don't need them. They're just for lower beings. They're just for people who are not like me, people who've mastered, who know about Mahamudra. But actually, if you look, observe carefully the lives of the great masters, you see they never neglect the opportunity to practice virtue. They never, they, they never uh, do this. They make their prostrations before their shrine. They make their shrine offerings and so on. And there's a story like this about Atisha who of course is the, the source of the Lojong teaching, or the one who brought it to Tibet. When Atisha came to Tibet, the Tibetans knew his reputation, that's why they invited him. This extraordinary great senior monk, this great Mahayana scholar, this great tantric practitioner. And uh, so they, of course, uh, provided an entourage for him and so on. And one day Atisha found here one of his uh, uh, disciples, one of his Tibetan disciples, making his tormas. And Atisha said, that's, I do that. 
And the, 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 the disciple said, Oh no, great master, you're so great. I will make the tormas for you. And then Atisha said to him, Are you trying to steal my merit? Because if Atisha let his servant make the tormas, who makes the merit? The servant. No merit for Atisha. So the disciples thought, Oh, Atisha is so great. His mind is kind of realized the middle way view. And so and he doesn't need to bother with making merit anymore. But he showed them by that, that even the great masters never neglect the practices for making merit. And that's really very important for us. So that is the power of white seeds. And then the fourth, the fourth power is the power of disenchantment. In Tibetan, sunjin, which I think actually we usually translate as reproach or regret. Anyway, this is how Kunchuk Yonlek explains this power. When self-cherishing arises, and as when some kind of self-cherishing mind occurs, when I'm grasping at self, respond with the thought, in the past I have met with suffering because of this, and in this life too it precludes or makes impossible the practice of the Dharma. And so with this thought, do away with or abandon such self-cherishing. In other words, when the tendency to feel sorry for yourself or self-protective when some difficulty comes up or strongly cling to ego arises, recognize what it is. It's your enemy. It won't protect you. It doesn't help you. It's the very thing that has given you all the trouble in the past and will now block your chance of development. You cannot grow in compassion and wisdom if you are so tightly bound up with self-pity, self-clinging, self-cherishing. So whenever such a small mind arises, throw it away. Refuse to be trapped by it. That is what is the fourth power, the power of uh, disenchantment. Like, because you're, I suppose, you're disenchanted with, you've become wise to the problems that your ego causes you. So you, you now want to get, have nothing to do with it. And then the fifth and final power is the power of aspiration, or in Tibetan, munlam, aspiration. Kujian mm. says, following all virtuous practices, you should write, recite, or make this aspiration prayer. A munlam or pranidhana in Sanskrit is a particular kind of prayer in which you pray for many positive results. Like in the Samantha Bhadra prayer that His Holiness talked about today when we pray that, we pray that we'll be able to be reborn in, and go in front of the Bodhi tree and achieve Buddhahood there. We pray that we will see many Buddhas that will travel to many different realms, make offerings to many Buddhas, and so on and, and so forth. In Shantideva's Munlam at the end of the Bodhicitta we pray, may a rain of flowers turn all weapons into flowers and so on and so forth. So we, an aspiration prayer is like a big mind a, a big mind with a great positive intention and it's very very helpful for us to have such aspiration so particularly in Lojong he says recite this aspiration prayer may I never be separated from bodhicitta or awakening mind and may I apply myself wholeheartedly to enlightened activities now that the Buddhas have taken me in their care May the actions of Maras, the, the principles of confusion, be dispelled. So it's a wish. Now we may say, oh, but a wish, it can't come true. It's just a wish. It's ridiculous to make such wishes. But Buddha has said, everything rests on the point of intention. So if we make strong intentions, these many of them actually will come about. And those that are not realizable, it's good for us to make anyway, because it changes our mind. It trains our mind effectively. 
So there are wishes that are realizable and other wishes that are not. But in both cases, it's very, very good for us to make such positive intentions. And to do it at the end of the practice ensures that whatever goodness we've made in that practice, like meditate ultimate bodhicitta, or meditating conventional bodhicitta, that it kind of goes to a great result. Its positive force is not wasted or drained away. It rather is connected with our real goal, which is Buddhahood and liberating all sentient beings. And so he says, pray to the Lama and the three jewels that this will happen as expressed and as the, the, your wishes will, will come true. So that is the fifth power, the power of, of Munlam, the power of uh, aspiration prayers. And as I said, that is why we stress this so much in Mahayana practice, making prayers like the Samantabhadra prayer or the, prayer at the end of the Bodhicharya and so on. Or the prayer of the Bodhisattva Maitreya. So that is the five powers as we practice them for this life. But then they also can be applied at the point of death. So now we have the Lojong teachings for the time of death. Geshe Chakra's root text says the Mahayana instructions for dying are the same five powers. Conduct is essential. So, in as how does a Lojong practitioner practice uh, at the time of death? How does he use his or her practice at the time of death? Well, now he's he will explain. Shama Kunji and will explain. So the first thing, the first of the five powers we rely on, it's not the same, and it's, notice it's not the same order as how we, they were explained previously. The first power is the power of sowing white seeds. How do you do that at the time of death? How do you make virtue when death is approaching? By giving. Give away everything you own as offerings and donations. In other words, whatever property you've acquired, so that it doesn't become a, 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 a something to hold you back at the time of death, something which you generate resistance to letting go, which you generate even more attachment to, at the thought of having to part from it. Instead, you, you use the power of white seeds to turn it into something positive. So give away what you've accumulated upwardly, so to speak, as offerings to your lamas and the three jewels by giving to the um, lamas, give to the monasteries, give to the monastic sanghas and uh, so on and for the production of dharma books and statues and so on and so forth. So use your assets in that way and donations means give to those in need. Use it in that way so that your hands become open and empty. Open, you don't hold anything back, and empty because you, you've given everything away, upwards and, and outwards. <coughs> of course, this, uh, uh, this and some of the other points, in fact all the other points really, uh, depend upon that the time of death is a kind of, is natural, and uh, and also you, you, it's kind of uh, not not immediate, not not so not instantaneous. So the second power to be used as death approaches is the power of aspirations, which is the fifth one earlier. Pray to the Lama and three jewels, and formulate the wish to perfectly accomplish bodhicitta. So you pray to your Lamas for their blessing. Pray to three jewels for the, the blessings of the three jewels and pray that as you go into the bardo you will be able to use this time, uh, the time of the moment of death and after to perfectly realize the two bodhicittas. So that is the power of aspirations. And again, it's see, just as giving 
the, the, through the white seeds is shaping the attitude into something positive. So this now shapes again the attitude so that you go forward into death with kind of openness and acceptance. Seeing it, in other words, as the way to fulfill the path that you entered upon in life. And then the third power is the power of disenchantment or reproach. For this thing, so in as if some uh, fearful or resistant thoughts resisting death, uh, the oncoming death arise, you have to cast these aside because otherwise they will obstruct you and hold you back. So you should think, even now, up till now I've been suffering because of clinging to a cherished self in this body. In other words, I've been clinging to this body as if it is the real, my real self and that's caused me so much suffering. But when examined, there's nothing whatsoever here which is the self. I'm just projecting it, just imagining that there is a self. R actually, f from the very moment of conception right till death, there is no self in this body. It is just an uh, appearance without any solidity. So there's nothing to regret or nothing to cling on to. Rather, one should regret the mind that clings on to it and let it go. With this thought, Kunjiyana says, self-clinging will surely cease. And then the next two powers, the first one is the compelling or impelling power, the first that was discussed earlier. For the compelling power, Shama Kunjiyana says, think, I will train in bodhicitta, due in the bardo and throughout future lives. So it's like, what's my basic take? What should be my basic take, my basic approach to what I'm going to pass through? It should be, it's a place for training bodhicitta. It's an opportunity for training bodhicitta, for bringing to fulfillment what I've started upon. And until enlightenment, I will continue in this way. So it's like, you go forward to meet it. You see it as a continuation of your practice. And fifth, the fifth power, the power of familiarization. As for the power of familiarization, begin with purification via or by the means of the relative bodhicitta practice of tonglen that rides the breath. Then settle without, sorry, then settle within the meditative equipoise, that means the meditative stability of ultimate bodhicitta free from any conceptual grasping. So, you know, as with this fifth power, Kunjun Lake like explains to us the essential meditation practice. The first four powers are like shaping the right attitude, getting our approach right, getting it positive and ready to go forward. Now for the actual method to be used at the time of death, it is of course Lojong. In other words, it's using the, the uh, true techniques of conventional bodhicitta, Tonglen, the taking, and ultimate bodhicitta, realizing mind's emptiness. Now, it's said in the root text, conduct is important. So, this is advice now for your posture at that time. Uh, so he says, conduct entails lying on the right side of the body with your right hand supporting your cheek. So the right side of the body, lying on the right side is how Lord Buddha lay down in Kushinagara at the time of the Parinirvana. So lay on, if you, of course if it's impossible, because it's too uncomfortable, then you shouldn't worry about it. But if possible, at that time, lay on the right side. When you know death is approaching very soon, then lay on your right side. With your right hand supporting your cheek, then block the right nostril with your little finger so that your breath comes and goes from the left nostril. In the, the significance of this is really explained in the, of course, in the Vajrayana. Uh, that is to say that 
the breath that goes through the right channel is this is called the channel of effort and experiences can arise very quickly through that channel but they're not stable whereas the left channel is the channel of life and although experiences don't come so quickly they're more stable so it is more suitable to rely on the breath coming and going through the the left the left channel so that's why you if you can you block the the right nostril and then you would begin by practicing the sending and taking so send and taking through the left nostril and then switch over to the ultimate bodhicitta practice to looking right into the nature of mind because whatever arises at that time whatever even if strange experiences arise through the dissolution of the elements the gathering of the winds and so on whatever strange appearances arise they're just mind there's no, they're nothing external to mind and this mind itself has no beginning and consequently it has no cessation it does not end it never arouses anything it cannot end we can't grasp it it has no location it is just like space so it is un arising unceasing unlike space just relax in that because that is the natural state of mind it is what will be experienced in its fullness at the actual moment of death so the more we settle into it now as death is approaching then the more we will be able to recognize it at that moment so we move back and forth between the two bodhicittas between the send and taking taking the sufferings of all beings onto ourselves as our own death approaches and sending all the merit we've gained through our practice throughout life to them so that they experience happiness and are placed on the path and then return again to the ultimate bodhicitta until gradually there's a kind of coalescence of these two that even when we're doing the send and taking at the same time we are we recognize the nature of mind to be like space and even when we're resting in the space space like nature of mind there is a sense of taking the sufferings of others and giving all happiness and and virtue to them Rinpoche made a point when teaching this of stressing how the more we can do this during life the more we can combine the two so that even when we're walking around during the day we can practice ascending and taking and at the same time rest in the space like nature of mind the easier it will be to do it at the at the time of death but this is the essential instruction the fifth power familiarization the actual meditation practice for the time of death what's very important about this is that it is something that is familiar to us through life because of course at the time of death many things are happening and so therefore as for practice it's essential to rely on the the thing that is most natural to us that we're most familiar with because our mind will easily settle in that whereas if we try to do something very complicated we will we'll not relax with it so if we're low jump practitioners have some experience then this is the the practice we should take as the as the transference as the Mahayana Powa and then there's a further uh, kind of additional instruction to this but maybe it's not so practical nowadays so you don't need to worry about it too much but I'll, I'll read it anyway as we did as for propitious that means like sacred zeti tendril the sacred substances as for propitious substances thoroughly grind a powder of magnetite so amateur chemists among you get working grind a powder of magnetite and burnt cowrie shells presumably every delicatessen has them mix it with wild honey and makes pea-sized pills beforehand 
I guess if you're on your deathbed, you better get somebody else to do that for you. <laughs> I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe the supermarkets have this ready stocked anyway. When the moment of death is nigh, it's kind of approaching, mix them with ale, chang, mix them with beer, and rub some on the crown of their head. So this is the uh, instruction. But this kind of connected with the medicine, of course, uh, because, um, well, we don't speak too much about the Vajrayana, but the, of all the exit places from the body that the mind can, the formless continuum of mind can go through, or appear to go through, of course the best is the, is the fontanelle. Uh, not the front one, but the one on the, the cranial dome. So we we're preparing that by rubbing the substance on that to make the make it a little easier. And uh, this is because, which explains that that uh, although the mind, which is formless, rides all the channels in the body. Uh, in all the different focal points. Nevertheless, the one which it rides mostly are the 32 channels in the crown chakra. And therefore, that is why it's best that it exits through that and that we, we prepare it in this way if we can. But I think it's, you know, Lamas usually nowadays say about this that if this kind of physical substance preparation is not possible, then we should not worry too much about it. The most important thing is to rely on the, the meditation instructions. Because the last thing I want to do is make, you know, is, is to make anybody anxious about this. Because um, confidence is so important. Well, we, if you don't mind, we'll do just a little bit more. Because uh, uh, I know how many more pages we have to do. You don't, but I do. And uh, so I, I kind of... Um, Feel we need to finish the whole text. So let's do a little bit at least of the fifth point. Because we're now finished the fourth point. The f five powers or five forces. We've got all the oral instructions for this life and for the time of death. So the fifth of the seven points. The fifth point presents how to evaluate progress in mind training because how do we check whether we're making authentic progress whether the the lojong is really working you see because you think about it if so, if you say oh my task is to learn mark puja it's kind of obvious whether you can do it or not uh, that is that is that is kind of obvious and also you know, if your task is to learn in the, you know, the, the, uh, the great uh, treatises, the great Shastras, you can be tested on that. Do you really know them? But with Lojong, it's a little tricky. You know, how do you test if this, because this is practice is, is, is working? You could, there's no such obvious visible signs of, learn, of, of mastery of this as there is with learning rituals and, 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 and texts. So, the fifth point is all about that. So first, the Geshe Chakra, one, one test is of course, you are now currently experiencing this Indian music as the music of the gods. <laughs> it is actually the celestial orchestra of the Gandavas who are playing this to delight us. I, I'm sure of that. <laughs> See what I mean? So, uh, and so the root text says, all Dharma is united in one objective. As a, like, there's one purpose, one aim in all Dharma practice. So the commentary says, in both the Hinayana and Mahayana, or we could just say in all the totality of the Buddha's teaching, Hinayana, Mahayana, whatever tradition, in Hinayana Mahayana traditions alike, 
the objective or the aim of all forms of the Dharma involves subduing ego clinging. In other words, that is what is that is what it's about. You know, Christianity is like serve God, be cheerful, serve God and be and be saved and and the sun and 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 so forth and but our aim is is is, uh, is subdue ego ego clinging if so if your dharma practice has not been effective as an antidote to ego then our entire practice has been useless if it has been effective as an antidote then Lojong, mind training, has truly dawned within us. So that's it. It's both very simple and very, like, uh, stark. Very simple because it's no big complicated test. If your clinging to ego is diminishing, the practice is working. If, on the other hand, your clinging to ego is getting bigger, your practice is, is not working. So it's simple and easy to understand, but in a way it's kind of a little bit awesome because it doesn't leave us any room to hide. Like, we can hide in mastery of the rituals. I mean, the rituals are really important, don't, don't misunderstand me. It's very important for the continuation of Dharma that the rituals are done. But you could just about master the rituals but leave your ego clinging intact or even become worse similar with dharma learning dharma learning of of, of the traditional texts is so incredibly important but you could do that and still have your ego intact or even made worse so there are places for your ego to hide in that those aspects of dharma but in this there is none because it's that it's like straight pointing at us has my ego clinging increased or is it decreased? Because if it's increased or not changed, this practice isn't working, no matter how much I'm putting in to it. But if my ego clinging, taking myself seriously, and so on and so forth, if that is diminished, the practice is working. So the, yes, the lojong is very, seems simple, but it is very, it leaves us very naked. And he said about a tisha that his means of teaching, it kind of puts the finger on our hidden spot. Because our hidden spot, of course, is conceit and pride. Uh, and this teaching doesn't give us any room to avoid that. Kind of, we have to really examine. And that's what comes up in the next line. Because the next line of the root text says, Of the two witnesses, heed the more important one. So what does this mean? Kunjian like explains. If your general appearance it's if your general appearance, like the way you behave and look and so on, is such that others see you as a practitioner and respect you, that is indeed a testimony or like evidence. But it is not the most important one actually. So it's it's good if other people think that you're behavior is in accord with Dharma that is some evidence that you are really genuinely a Dharma practitioner or if you're a practitioner of Lojong that is working but it's not the deep evidence why ordinary people cannot read your thoughts if they happen to catch you engaging in positive conduct they may be quite impressed so they may see you going to the temple they may see you sitting cross-legged but they don't know what's going through your mind at that time. Your mind may be a million miles away. Or you may be thinking, don't I cut a handsome figure as I stride purposefully through the shrine room doors and take my place on my cushion and execute a perfect seven-point posture of Vairochana so all the pretty women will see me. <laughs> okay. Um, Hands up and apologize. <laughs> but you, so they may see the ex, they may well see these externals, but they don't know what's going on in your mind. But you know if you have nothing to be ashamed of, 
Therefore, the most important witness is you. In other words, you can examine yourself. And therefore, you know whether you are an authentic practitioner or a kind of Dharma hypocrite, who is just an external show, but inside is still kind of servant of the, the hungry beast of uh, self, self-clinging. And so again, it's the, the Lojong is, is, is relies, the Lojong demands from us a kind of complete honesty, ruthless honesty with, our, with, our, with ourselves. It's like there's nowhere to hide in this teaching. We can't fake it with a nice smile or a kind of nice appearance. It, it's what is in the heart and we know that actually. So we need to look into ourselves. And then the third measurement, an ever serene mind, uh, happy mind maybe, but if you prefer serene, okay. An ever serene mind is the only recourse. So, continue like explains. From now on, even if a calamitous situation were to arise, it would be acceptable, as you, know, you could you could accept it, because you could incorporate it into the path of mind training. With this kind of thought, nothing poses a threat. So relax. So it means like this: if you are really trained in lojong, you don't have that rigidity which likes some things and dislikes others. So he's always reacting with irritation when something unexpected arises. There's a story about a teacher that when he went to Tibet, this is an example of what a great practitioner he was, by the way. When he went to Tibet, he was presented, and you've got to remember, Tisha came from an extremely sophisticated culture. 11th century Bengal was a wonderful culture, wonderful Buddhist culture, and Tisha is like one of the great products of it, this extraordinarily sophisticated intellectual, so highly cultivated, and with such great spiritual realization. So he goes to this barbarian country, Tibet. And what do they offer him for refreshment? Tibetan tea. <laughs> of course, it's, can, you can imagine the shock to Atisha at this time. But he was truly trained in Lojong because when he was offered this Tibetan tea, his response was, what is this nectar? The gods must drink this. <laughs> <laughs> so that is, I think, uh, if you ever had the slightest doubt that Atisha was true master of Lojong, it is conquered by this, this story. And this is the example of this, of this line. If we have trained in Lojong, we can deal with any situation. We have that happiness as our as our as our basis and then uh, last line from the this uh, fifth point if you are able even when distracted you have trained well so could you like explains even when distracted able riders do not fall from their horses so you know when when some sudden obstacle turns up in front of the horse and the horse suddenly stops or whatever or moves to one side or gaps very quickly or whatever it does a really experienced rider can hold on to that to that horse they're not they're not thrown so similarly for us nothing throws us Kunjana says similarly even when harm doers and their like suddenly appear if we do not experience anger, but use the situation to enhance, our, enhance strengthen, our lojong practice, the mind has been well trained. Again, it's this same theme of suppleness, spaciousness of mind that the lojong practices bring about. We're not rigid, we're not tight, we don't have small boundaries we're open and, and flexible because everything is the path. So no matter where things come from to us, we can, we can always deal with them. We don't lose our 
balance we are centered we're centered in the in the heart really and so we, we're never thrown off course and everything becomes part of the practice part of the path so now Kuchi Ilak ends this chapter with this uh, this fifth point with this comment these evaluations or measurements of mind training show whether Lojong has developed uh, in your mind but that does not mean that when you have trained well like this you need train no longer you know, so you don't retire at this point <laughs> training must continue until Buddhahood has been achieved it's because that is the reason we entered into it so this fifth point is just like a check we make to see where we're going in the right direction you know like am I still going in the same direction I started off in because you know it's, it's true isn't it you know we, we can start off in Dharma with good intentions or in a practice with good intentions but things happen in our life and we 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 kind of be overpowered by them and we lose our sense of direction we lose a sense of what the practice is really for or maybe we start to practice and we overcome some initial problems and then we start to drift we start to drift because we've solved a few problems that were that were really bringing us down that were giving us difficulties and then we start to drift and the practice loses its force well, we forgot that's because we've forgotten where we're really aiming at so hence his caution here even if there's some success in your practice is only the path it is not the goal you must carry on until the the goal is achieved so I think we'll stop here maybe just sit for a couple of minutes uh, in, in meditation and then dedicate merit and then we have points six and seven to do tomorrow and the day after because they're, they're quite they're quite long <laughs> Pardon Savila Marum Bushi Dagi Chi or Pemedin Shun a Kadin Chim Bogun a Jusan de Kusun to Jinodu Sadu so Sunnam de Tam Jizik Bani Tobi Nebi Dan Chigana Jibala Dripa Yesipi Sala Drua Drua Shu. Okay. So sleep well. <laughs>